Nothing but the blood of Jesus This is all my righteousness Nothing but the blood of Jesus Some of you may be familiar with the story of Plato's cave, found in Book 7 of the Greek philosophers The Republic. It is an allegory of some men who, from birth, were chained up facing a wall in the cave. Now, chained as they were, they could not see behind them. The only light in the dark cave was cast by a fire behind them. As people moved behind them, the light cast shadows on the wall. Those shadows were the only thing they ever saw other than themselves. That was their world. Now one day, one man broke free from his change, and he ventured behind, seeing a light coming from beyond. As he moved the light, it became increasingly brighter, so he had to move slowly for his eyes to adjust. Finally, he emerged from the cave to the outside world, where he was shocked, absolutely shocked by what he saw. It made no sense to him. Nothing seemed real to him. Only the shadows cast by the sun, because shadows had been his reality for his entire life. But bit by bit, he began to realize that he was in a wonderful world, and the shadows had been just that, mere shadows of reality, and not reality itself. It was a day of good news for him. Now, excitedly, he returned to the cave to share the good news with his companions. But as much as he tried, they refused to believe him. Their minds could not grasp the existence of a different reality. Uh, they even turned hostile towards him because they were blind to a better reality and did not want to even think that what they had was not true. The shadows were their reality. Now, while Plato intended to help people understand what he was trying to share with them and to do this through his philosophy, I think it may also be instructive for us as we consider our text in Luke 4, 13 through 19. Here is the background to this particular text. Jesus had just started his ministry. 
After his baptism in the river Jordan, he was led out, the Bible says, into the wilderness where he fasted for 40 days and endured the onslaught of Satan's temptations. Now, at each temptation, Jesus resisted and overcame until finally the devil left him alone to seek another opportunity he hoped in the future. Now, Jesus Full of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, returned to Galilee and began preaching and healing people. Our text picks up when after time he returned to his hometown Nazareth and as usual went into the synagogue for worship on the Sabbath. Jesus was invited to read from the scriptures. The text says, that's Luke 4, 16 through 18 from the New International Version. From verse 16. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. On rolling it, he found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the Lord's, uh, the year of the Lord's favor. Now, if you read it to the end, you will discover that after he returned to his seat, the worshipers were so incensed that they grabbed hold of him and took him outside, ready to throw him over the cliffside to his death. That was their intention. But the Holy Spirit removed him from both their grasp and their vision and led him away safely. Now, we wonder, why were they so angry? It was because of what Jesus said after reading Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2, commonly understood to be a messianic prophecy, a prophecy about the anointed one, the Christ, the Messiah. Isaiah wrote about how Christ would come and what his mission would be. And here was Jesus, whom they recognized as the son of Joseph and Mary, telling them that the prophecy was about him. It was a declaration that he was the Christ. Let's look a little closer at the mission of the Messiah. The Bible says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Jesus is the anointed one, specifically set apart by the Father to do the work of God as a king, prophet, and priest. This is why Jesus, the Son of God, is called the Messiah, a Hebrew word meaning the Anointed One, or in the Greek, the Christ. His first task was to preach good news or good tidings to the poor. When Jesus told them that he was the Christ, it was a declaration that the day they had longed for for 700 years, a day of the best news they could ever imagine, had arrived in him. I don't know what you consider as good news. Maybe the birth of your child. Someone buying you a new house and leaving you without a mortgage. Uh, getting your dream job or being healed and declared cancer-free. But for a nation whose country had been conquered and occupied for hundreds of years, many taken into captivity and ruled by oppressors, the idea of a liberation from their rulers by the Messiah was good news, and they could only dream about such news. However, Messiah had good news that went beyond their cave thinking. It was news of the forgiveness of mankind's sin, the complete and total redemption of a people who had willingly chosen death and lived under its daily threat. 
It was news that through the grace of God, humanity could be saved from all destruction and be restored to paradise. The text says that Messiah would preach good news to the poor. Now, who are the poor? Now, we would think it refers to those who are destitute. Those who crouch in the streets as beggars, having nothing at all. They were the people who, in the days of, of Jesus, were despised by the religious leaders. Uh, these are the people today who many still despise and who some even blame for their own poverty. These are the poor who, because of their desperate situation, are often exploited and oppressed by others. For those caught up in a lifetime of poverty, there is no past, only sadness and pain. The present is filled with distress and the future is dismal and dark. There are no pleasures in recollection and there is no relief in hope. So yes, it does refer to them, but it also refers to those who recognize their true condition as sinners. These are the poor in spirit because they are not the proud who think they've arrived. No, they recognize their great need for something better. They know they have nothing to recommend them to God. Then... There are the poor who have many possessions and who are generally good, decent people. But still, there is a gnawing emptiness in their lives that cannot be filled by work, money, fame, or any other human being. They feel they need for some source of comfort that the world cannot give, but often do not know where to look. Now, I don't know if you can identify it with being among the types of poor I described. But to you, the Messiah says, today I have good news for you. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed. You know, when Israel was under occupation and many people had been led into captivity, those hearing Isaiah's words about liberation could clearly understand the imagery. This was not simply referring to those in prison, but those who had been taken captive against their will and led off into a far land away from their loved ones. Like the Africans who are captured and sold by other tribes, the slave traders, like animals and led in chains to the slave ships that took them to North and South America and the Caribbean. It was a ghastly and unimaginable experience. Generation after generation, the most pressing thing on their minds and in their hearts was to be set free to be liberated. Perhaps the worst type of imprisonment that we can think of are those who are locked away in the deepest dungeons and left there to rot in the cold and darkness. Yet there is a captivity and imprisonment far worse than any ever inflicted by stone walls and iron chains. It is the bondage of sin. You know, sin always looks good at first. Maybe like the first time someone decided to try a drug uh, just to see if the high people described feels as good as they say. And as they may be edged on by their friends, just once is the plan. And yes, they love the high so much that they have to do it again and again until before they know it, the drug has become their master and they its slave. Every type of sin is like that because sin is like a friend who turns out to be a despotic triant, tyrant rather, and it becomes a, a power which holds you in its grasp and, and rules your life. 
It defaces you and turns you from what God intended into someone who is only fit for the gutters on the street. This is true of sin in all its manifestations. Whether it be pride, yes, pride, vanity, hate, prejudice, jealousy, or immorality, or worse, outright rebellion against God. When people live as if there's no heaven, no hell, and no divine being to whom we must all give account. Like the people in Plato's cave, chained from birth, did not realize that the purpose of the chains was to keep them captive. We often do not realize that from birth we were chained by sin. Psalm 51 verse 5 says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. You know, we truly are prisoners nonetheless, held captive by sin. And the, there are various forms of captivity. There is a captivity into which we are slowly and gradually drawn. Often we will try to deny it. But our denial does not change the fact. We are easily seduced by sex, the delusion of money, or the, the fallacy of pride and the illusion of power and the transience of fame and prestige. We can never get enough. We just get sucked in at one time or another. Maybe right now in our lives, one or more of these things have been controlling us. But I have good news for you. Jesus declared, I have been sent to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed. My friends, Jesus will release you from captivity by giving you a deep sense of your sin and by showing you its utterly destructive power that seeks to wreak havoc on you. And when you see it for what it is, it loses its appeal to you and you long to be free from it. Jesus frees you from sin by forgiving you and erasing all records of your sin treating you like you have never done anything wrong. He restores you to a right relationship with the Father and you live in God's good grace and favor. The Bible says in Romans 6.14 that you are no longer under the control of sin. In verse 18 it adds, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. You become a new person and God takes up residence in your life. In the same way that we don't often realize we are captive to sin, we rarely think of ourselves as blind. Physically, there are different degrees of blindness. Some people are legally blind but uh, do not need to walk with a white stick. When Jesus lived out his ministry, he fulfilled this prophecy because he restored sight to the blind physically. You know, uh, they knew they were blind and they asked for sight. But some people just do not realize they are blind and so never ask for sight. Plato's cave describes this very well. The reality of the people resided in the shadows cast on the wall. Even when told of a different reality by the one who returned from the outside, they rejected him and held to their blindness. Someone once said that while it may be bad to be physically blind, it is worse to be mentally blind, to close off one's mind and unwillingness to consider an alternative. Trapped according to uh, Bob Marley in his song, Mental Slavery. However, it is worse still to be morally blind or spiritually blind. 
when a person can see nothing bad in dishonesty, nothing shameful in discrimination, nothing revolting in the obscene, and nothing repulsive about selfishness. Yet worst of all is to be spiritually blind. Worse because that is the root and the source of all others. Blindness of spirit, a darkness in which the person fails to recognize the truth of God and misses out on receiving his gift of life. Jesus gives sight to the blind by opening their eyes to the truth of the kingdom of God. He opens men's eyes to the wonder and majesty of God, but also of the nearness of God to us. He helps us to see that God is not remote in some distant universe, but can be right beside us, and that he can be reflected in the life of his people. He becomes personal to us. The text says, He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Finally, Jesus brings a sinner's dire situation together by categorizing the captivity and the blindness as being oppressed. And then he offers us complete deliverance and promise of the restoration of all things as God intended when he created our world. In ancient Israel, as recorded in Leviticus 25, the year of, the, of Jubilee, the year of the Lord's favor, the 50th year, a proclamation was made that all the Hebrew slaves were to be released, all debts written off, and the land returned to its original owners. This, the Jubilee symbolized the start of a new era. When Messiah came, he would usher in the start of an even greater era, one of complete restoration of people to their creator, a return to God, giving sight to the blind, freeing the prisoners, and the releasing of the oppressed were signs that that era had commenced. And indeed, with the coming of Jesus, it was a day of good news. Every man, woman, and child held captive by sin, blind to our condition, constantly oppressed by the devil and the suffering of all the consequences of sin, could experience salvation through and by him, Jesus, the Anointed One. Through the Messiah, we can be liberated from that which holds us captive. Through Jesus, we can experience freedom from the power of sin in our lives. No matter what degree of mental, moral, or spiritual blindness you may be experiencing, the same power Jesus used to restore people's physical eyesight, he will use to open your eyes to all that he has for you. Like the man in Plato's cave, you will recognize your previous reality was a bundle of shadows cast by a weak flame. And you will experience the reality that God brings. Maybe this is the first time you're hearing this. And it may, may, may not make much sense at first to you. On the other hand, maybe you are very familiar with the story about Jesus. Whether it is the first time or you are already familiar with the story. If you are truly honest with yourself you know that there is an emptiness in your life that cannot be filled by all the things with which you are now trying to fill it. Perhaps sin has you in its grip. And while you sense that it will not turn out well for you, it's hard to shake it off, 
to pull back from what you're caught up in. You know you should turn from it, but all your efforts seem to be in vain. You know what's happening in your life right now. And it was not by chance that you came to this YouTube channel. I am convinced that God led you here because he knows your need to be free from that power that has you in his grasp. It may be an addiction that you've been trying to shake, but every time you feel you are free of it, you find yourself falling right back into its arms. It may be a, a sin that feels good, but at the same time leaves you feeling ashamed and miserable. You long to be free from its power. Maybe you're searching for a better way to live your life. You're dissatisfied with your life right now because you know that there must be something better than what is presented to you in the media and you feel an emptiness that needs to be filled. All you know is the darkness of your cave and your reality is just the shadows cast by the flickering lights. So you are searching, looking for meaning and purpose. Today is a day of good news. And the news for you is that Jesus can and will deliver you from whatever has you in its power. He will forgive you and heal you from your brokenness. And he will restore you to God. No matter what it is, God can heal you of it. There isn't anything so bad that you may have done that God cannot forgive and heal. If you're suffering from guilt, he will free you from it and give you peace. If it's shame it has you, he'll release you and restore your self-esteem and well-being. If you're looking for a real purpose for living, God has just what you need and what will bring you true meaning and joy in your life. However, God has just one condition. His condition is that you must be willing to let him work his power in your life to free you, to forgive you, heal and restore you. That's all. And it's free. Are you willing? Right now, at this very moment, you can be free. God wants to save you. You are precious to him. And he wants the best for you. He wants to give you his righteousness and to bless you. Are you willing to receive God's righteousness, his goodness and kind favor? If you do, Pray in your mind and your heart right now and ask him to do this for you. If you don't know what to pray, then you can pray by sincerely repeating after me. Jesus, save me from my sin. Free me from my captivity. And open my eyes to your love and truth. Remove the shadows from my life and give me your reality and the assurance of everlasting life. Amen. If you'd like to learn more about this topic or speak with someone to learn how you can live a life that will give you joy and freedom, do connect with us by visiting our website kinesafellowship.com or if ever you are in the greater Toronto area join us on a Saturday morning for worship at 1655 Wilson Avenue Toronto now remember to subscribe to our channel and share this and other videos from our channel and do this with your friends and your family and remember to like us thank you <laughs>